Hello and welcome to another Royal Society Publishing video podcast. Philosophical Transactions B have published a theme issue on metacognition and today I'm talking to two of the guest editors of the issue, Professor Chris Frith and Dr Steve Fleming. So Steve, can you explain to me what exactly is metacognition? Metacognition is thinking about thinking and it occurs when we self-reflect on our decisions, on our memories, on our perceptions of the world. And um, a, a nice example is when um, our reflection, our self-reflection, um, separates away from the underlying cognitive process. So one example would be in memory, um, if I ask you what's Elton John's real name, for instance, you might know that you know the answer, but you can't quite get it yet. But if you spend long enough, um, you'll have this feeling on the tip of your tongue that there's something there, um, and eventually it will come to light. And so this is an example, it's quite a strange example, because it suggests that there are parts of the brain that know about your memory, but they can't get it. Um, but the whole brain is carrying out all our functions, memory, perception, decision making. So it suggests that there's a separation here between something that's meta level, that's monitoring another level. Um, and that's part of the way you can start investigating metacognition. You can start asking people to reflect upon um, their ongoing mental processes. I guess psychologists have approached this as rather than talking about thinking about thinking, they talk about monitoring and control. And an example would be when you're doing something like typing, you monitor what you're doing so you notice if you've made an error and then you slow down, which is the control bit to prevent the error happening in the future. And I guess an interesting question is to what, if you define it in those terms, how closely does it relate to self-reflection and metacognition in that sense? And how does metacognition relate to consciousness? First of all, there's some metacognition that may not be conscious, that we certainly do spend a lot of time thinking about what we're doing, but there's also aspects of consciousness that don't seem to be metacognitive in the sense that I'm simply aware, and I'm not aware that I'm aware. And there's a nice experiment by Johnson Schuler where he points out that if you're reading a tedious textbook, after about two minutes you realise that you weren't reading, that you were, your eyes were crossing the page, but you were actually thinking about what am I going to have for supper tonight. So you were clearly conscious at that point, but you were not conscious that you were not doing what you were supposed to be doing. So there are these two levels of consciousness, and maybe only the higher level is actually truly metacognitive. And another, another example of, of a similar process is when you, you are driving and you zone out and you can continue to drive and perform a very complex task but you're not aware that you're driving. There's at least some evidence that you can you can have monitoring and control without being aware of it. On the other hand we do spend a great deal of our time thinking about what we're doing and why we're doing it like why am I doing this interview and am I fiddling about wrongly. Um, so there's clearly Con meta some metacognition is definitely conscious, but whether there's metacognition that's unconscious as well is a controversy, I guess, still. So do other animals have metacognition? Well, in a sense, we've sort of what we've talked about indicates that it might be very difficult to find out because the way you find out with people is that they tell you about it and that they're thinking about their thinking. And if you, if you believe that sensible reactions to stimuli the environment shows that you're conscious, then animals are conscious. But if you're talking about this tip of the iceberg, then probably they're not. What people have tried to do is to find ways of enabling animals to report what their experiences are like. The animal or the human is presented with a word or, or a picture and, you, and they, their question is, did you see this before? And you press a button. Um, and they can do much better than chance, but you can then ask, you can provide them with an extra button which says, if you don't know, press this button. And animals, monkeys at least, and I think rats as well, can learn to do this. So that seems to imply that they know that they don't know. So that might be metacognition. But. <laughs> but, and there is a but to that, but you can always try to explain that kind of behavior in a way that might not require metacognition. So in the type of task that Chris was describing, 
um, if the animal treats that third button as a button just to gain a certain reward, then you can start constructing an explanation in terms of the amount of reward available from the different buttons. Um, as some of the papers in the special issue show that the, the jury is still out, the debate is still ongoing about which animals do or do not have what we would call metacognition. But there's also a, a problem as soon as you start being very critical about these methods for deciding whether animals have metacognition or not, you can then ask the question, why do we think that people have metacognition? Which is very much along the lines of why do we think other people are conscious? They might all be zombies, really, and they're just behaving. And in a sense, that's not quite solved either. And what's the function of metacognition and why is it important? It's obviously important to be able to monitor and control your own behaviour. And I guess the way, the sort of way you can get at its importance is to look at what happens when it breaks down. So, for example, in people with dementia are unaware that their memory is no good. There's a, a big problem in psychiatric patients in general, particularly in schizophrenia, was where they deny that they are ill and stop taking the medication, which makes them worse and have also very weird symptoms like experiencing other people's thoughts being put into their heads, which I regret to say we still don't understand at all, but is an example of the very top end, I think, of metacognition. And that the very top end of conscious of metacognition where we're actually reflecting on what we're doing, I like the idea that this is actually has an important social function, so we can actually tell people why we did something. And it turns out that in most of the time we're not very good at knowing why we did things, but by actually discussing it with other people we get better. And one of the very interesting cases um, that was covered in the special issue is that of blind sight. And a, a patient who has blind sight will be clinically blind in, their, in half of their visual space due to an injury to the back of the brain. But they'll be able to guess well above chance about what, they, what is present in that blind field. And um, one of the contributions to the issue devised a, com a computational model um, to try to explain why this um, failure occurs. Um, this, this disconnection between what the patient claims they see and what they are able to respond to. And how does the brain come to know about itself? So this is a, a difficult question for reasons that are connected with how do we measure metacognition. Um, so, for instance, if we were to try and work out which part of the brain um, responds to faces in our environment, we could design an experiment, which has been done, um, to compare the responses of your brain, if you're lying in a brain scanner, to when I show you a picture of a face, to responses to, say, other objects. Yeah, that's right. So the face area is just here. The bottom of the temporal lobe yes. is on the right. Yes. So we can start localising particular regions of the brain that are processing particular aspects of our environment or of, in our cognition. Um, and so to, try, to start doing that with metacognition, we need a way of, of measuring how people are, um, come to know, come to self-reflect about their own cognition. And this is often done using reports of confidence. So if I ask you um, to remember what you did this, to, uh, this time last week, you might be fairly uncertain, but you could give me a, a rough guess. And you would, but then if I ask you to remember what you had uh, for breakfast, then you'd be strongly um, certain about that memory. So you can give a response to both questions, but your confidence level might differ. And what's quite interesting is that um, the initial evidence for particular brain areas involved in metacognition came from studies of patients who'd had brain damage to the prefrontal cortex. So that's the area of the brain. Um, this is the front, this is the back of the brain. And it's the area at the front of the brain, which we think is involved in planning and higher cognition. Um, particular patterns of brain damage in the prefrontal cortex meant that patients, even though they could remember things, their confidence in those memories was um, distorted. So it didn't often match up with their performance on the memory task. 
they'd either be overconfident or underconfident. And so that's quite interesting because it suggests to us that there are differences between regions of the brain that are actually retrieving the memories and regions of the brain that are involved in um, monitoring the confidence in those memories. And more recently, um, various groups have started to work on um, what happens in the healthy brain when people reflect on their decision making and memory processes. And in those cases you get um, particular patterns of activity in um, the anterior, so the most frontal part of the prefrontal cortex, um, which correlates both with the confidence that you have in your decision and it, it predicts um, individual differences in how well you can monitor your own decision. So just, just, just at the front here. Um, so we think that um, by kind of putting all the evidence together, we're starting to build up a picture of the functions of the prefrontal cortex in metacognition. And one particular um, pattern that's emerging, um, which is covered in the special issue, is that there might be differences between the, the parts of the prefrontal cortex that are involved in monitoring what I've done in the past and the parts of the prefrontal cortex that are involved in um, predicting how well I'm going to do in the future. And so the more lateral, so towards the edges of the brain, those regions seem to be more involved in what's what we call retrospective metacognition, so metacognition about the past. And the more medial aspects seem to be involved in monitoring how well I'm going to do in the future or predicting what I'm going to be doing in the future. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Chris. And thank you for watching this video podcast.